Our first speaker today is Dr. Uh, Vince Jones, who's speaking on monitoring and modeling natural enemies to enhance biological control in Western U.S. tree fruit crops. He has several uh, co-authors. Uh, Dr. Jones is professor of entomolo in entomology, Washington State University Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center in Wenatchee. Welcome, Vince. Okay, this is going to be a real quick talk. As you can see by my uh, abstract, I overthought the amount of time we were going to have. So I'll go through most of the stuff fairly quickly. So I want to start off with a very short background, move to talking about monitoring natural enemies using herbivore-induced plant volatiles and floral lures, then talk about natural enemy models and give you an example of one of those. Talk about organic versus conventional and the effects on natural enemy and the different management practices. And then talk about pesticide models and then summarize the whole thing. So the background here can be skipped because Nick Mills did this. And the truth is, is that really what people want us to do is to spray less, spray smarter, use biocontrol and have no residues at the end of the season. And so what we've been trying to do in our uh, specialty crop research initiative grant is to first figure out what some of these problems are. And one of the problems is we need to have ways to monitor natural enemies. Most of the time, people realize biocontrol isn't working only when there's a disaster happening. So there's been a lot of work with these uh, herbivore-induced plant volatiles. They're essentially chemicals released by the plants when it insect feeds on the plant, it attracts natural enemies, and floral lures do the same thing. And that trap there, um, despite the very ugly appearance of that, shows a large number of lacewings caught on one of our uh, traps. The previous studies with these things had shown the potential, but we knew that we needed these things to be reliable for them to be used in commercial agriculture. And so we needed to have uh, reliable release rates, dose effects, know what the activity spectrum in terms of which of the natural enemies were attracted, notice uh, the effects of uh, mixing attractants in a lure, and the effects of trap type. And our grant actually uh, solved most of these problems. Uh, we've done a lot of work on this. And in fact, we've tested over 15 different attractants in 55 different combinations. Um, some of these uh, attractions, uh, attractants are very specific, bringing in only a single species and in some case, only one sex of a particular species. Some of them are very general, bringing in a wide range of taxa. And overall, when you look at these, and particularly when we're testing as many as we are, you can be overwhelmed by the total number of natural enemy taxa that you get. And some of them, as Nick mentioned, are these beautiful little wasps that when you actually try to look at them, there's very few features that tell them apart. And unless you actually have somebody who's an expert taxonomist, it's pretty hard to do it. And so we've tried to reduce the numbers that we're looking at in general um, to uh, a couple different groups. Now, the attraction that we see, we're testing this on apple, sweet cherry, uh, pear, and walnuts. We don't really seem to see any attraction variance between the different crops. That is, if the particular species occurs in a crop, then they are attracted in the same manner as they are in the other crops as well. The lace wings uh, that you see here, green lace wings, and the surfid flies are highly attracted. And so these are also very large and they're the ones that we're trying to use as uh, basically our indicator species of the effects of pesticides on natural enemies. Now, one of the things I wanna tell you about is how much more effective they are than other methods for sampling natural enemies. And so this is a study that Dave Horton and I from the USDA ARS lab down in uh, Wapato did. We had five different orchards. We tested uh, these with beating trays. We went out two to three times a week, sampling 50 trees each time from March through October. We had uh, an HIPV trap that attracted lace wings. Uh, we would look at that trap once a week. We had four traps in a block and the same uh, sampling period. And so one of the things that you get right off is with the beating trays, it said that the uh, lace wings were out there for a 46 day period, whereas the um, natural enemy traps told us that they were out there 61 days before that and 46 days after. So that the time that they're out there and active is uh, 153 days versus 46. 
The other thing is, notice the difference in the number of caught. We only catch 12 of them in the beating trays. They're very inefficient for insects, which fly very well, versus 25,600 that are caught in the traps. And basically, the message that this gives you in terms of pest management is these things are very rare in space and time if you're using a beating tray, versus they're abundant throughout the season. And in terms of management, the importance of only 12 is minuscule versus it's obviously a key predator in our system based on the numbers that we're catching alone. Now, one of the nice things about these HIPV traps is that we can give them to IPM consultants so that they can actually see the consequences of their actions. And so we have, uh, again, uh, the lace wings over here, and these are mostly serpent flies over there. Uh, they can actually evaluate side by side or before and after what their different management tactics did to the natural enemy complex. And then the idea is for them to start choosing the severity of what they're doing based on the natural enemy complex as well as the pest uh, population level. As far as one of the nice things about these lures, they bring in large numbers, we can start to develop phenology models for them. So determining when they occur in the season. And this shows uh, basically a red line when those uh, generated bad looking dots there are actually the real data that we see out there. And we actually get very good agreement between walnut, sweet cherry, and apple. This is data from 2009 and 10, and it's about or 18 orchard years worth of data. And it looks really nice. And then when you look at one of these crops, and I'll look at sweet cherry here, unfortunately, there's a missing gray box Uh, of the lace wings that are caught in that particular area. That's an area where the first generation should occur. And there's heavy pesticide sprays in both conventional and organic at this point in time to control black cherry aphid, uh, walnut, or uh, western cherry fruit fly, and uh, powdery mildew of uh, cherries. And so you can get these pesticide uh, effects that occur. And this has sort of led us into the next section, which is basically the idea of conventional versus organic. And both of these two systems can produce really high quality, clean fruit, but there's a completely different way that you're actually applying mortality in those systems using the different insecticides. So for organic insecticides, the intensity of mortality is very low. It only lasts for a short period. You apply it more frequently. But as Nick mentioned, the complex of the natural enemies has to be larger and more important in terms of getting you uh, your clean fruit, where the conventional is exactly the opposite, with the big difference is they will take natural enemies if they're there, but that's not their primary way that they feel that they're controlling their pests. So the question then is, is does the organic way of applying mortality lead to less impact on natural enemies and greater stability in the system? And so there's a, a way to test that. And so one of the things that we started thinking was, not only do we want to test that, but we want to see if we can mimic that using uh, conventional insecticides. Well, one of the things that you can see is that dose makes the toxin. And that's pretty much true uh, for most materials. And so what we did is we decided to try 10% of the field rate of a disruptive chemical and a full rate of a disruptive chemical into an organic block. So we have a 15 acre block. We took uh, it out of organic production. We kept a third of it uh, as organic and or only organic controls were applied there. We uh, used control for coddling moth using this 10% field rate, applied at the same rates as the virus and oil that we were using in the organic. And then we had uh, fewer of these uh, full dose uh, conventional. And when you look at this, by going to 10%, the intensity of mortality is less, the duration is less, the number of times applied is more, the natural enemy complex has to be more important, and the cost drops by uh, 80%, as well as the residues dropping by 80% here. And you don't have as many restrictions on production. Okay, so we started this last year in 2011. And what we found was, first of all, that there was no significant differences in any of the pest populations we looked at. 
Secondly, in the full rate treatment, we essentially knock the populations of natural enemies down immediately following those pesticide applications for a two to three week period. And then all of a sudden they returned. And what was happening is they were moving in from the other treatments, which weren't experiencing that high and low. And so it essentially shows how you can do spot treatments and get movement of natural enemies back, even using a relatively harsh material. We've also been looking at uh, the difference in paired plots between conventional and organic insecticides. And so we've done this in four pairs of orchards. I'll show you this in just a second. But in terms of the pest populations, we're not seeing any differences in those as well. This shows um, the population levels in uh, four different pairs of blocks. Uh, so you have the red lines here are conventional. The blue lines are organic. The red open uh, uh, diamonds here are uh, the conventional treatments. The blue diamonds here are organic. And if it's a solid organic, it uses in trust, which is one of the more uh, harsh materials that's available. And so when you look at these population pressures, and this is the lace wings, this group here and this group here both have very soft programs, both the conventional and the organic. And you can see there's not much difference in the population trends in those situations at all. But when they're both harsh, and you can see that there's a whole bunch of oil and virus applications and then a large number of entrust at lower rates than normal, the organic seems to have higher populations in there. Similarly, in this case, we have a very soft or uh, conventional treatment, but a large number of oil applications. So I would consider that a medium harsh organic and essentially, you get the same phenology and the same trends that you see in the uh, very soft conventional. Another uh, predator, this is Dariochorus brevis here. It's uh, um, in the two soft blocks. Again, you see pretty much the same phenology. You get a different uh, pattern a little bit in the organic. But if you take a look at this where they're both harsh, again, the blue is predominant there. So you're getting a lot more Dariochorus in those plots versus this area here where you have the soft and the con uh, conventional and the medium organic, you're still getting a little bit more in the organic, uh, even though it's a more harsh treatment than what you're getting in those areas. And so it appears that organic treatments are a little bit softer and the way that you're applying mortality on the population dynamics. This leads us to the next step, which is starting to realize that we don't know uh, what's going on in terms of how pesticides actually affect both pest and natural enemies. So this graph here shows a black line, which is what a control would be, and then a blue line here, which shows what happens if you apply a single pesticide that kills 90% of the population for seven days. You can see that there's a big difference. And not only that, but that difference goes from generation to generation. So if you're going to be harsh early in the season, that's going to have an effect all the way through versus trying to be soft uh, at the start of the season. And you can do things like change the length of the residue, so that's twice as long. Uh, and you can see that the effect, again, is found in each one of those uh, generations. But the nice thing is, because these are actually based on degree days, you can actually put regular programs on and see what happens to both the pest and the natural enemies. So this is actually uh, control here. You have uh, four different other treatments, and then three conventional sprays, two in the first generation, one in the second, versus two in the second and two in the first. You can have two conventional sprays and a mating disruption, or you can have four oil plus virus sprays only in the first generation and mating disruption, and see that basically you're getting as good a control with that organic as any of those conventional. And not only that, but you can turn it into, if we've got 15% damage, what will we see with those numbers out there as a relative ratio? And so you can start to get to the point where you can see the cost and benefit of every spray you put on. And then you can also see what happens to the natural enemies in those situations as well. So in summary, uh, new natural enemies, attractants actually open the door to generate uh, better biocontrol in some of these areas because we're actually knowing what's going on. Natural enemy models are actually being used to help us reduce their exposure to uh, pesticides uh, by changing timings one way or another. 
The organic method of control is actually uh, appears to be softer to the natural enemies based on our first year data. And the organics can still be harsh to those natural enemy groups. And Nick mentioned uh, in trust, and I think Tom will mention that after my talk. And they can also be used with those ultra low doses of conventional insecticides to essentially make it easier to get into organic uh, rather than just make the jump right off. And then pesticide models can also give us a better understanding of the population dynamics and how to actually minimize the impacts on the natural enemies. Uh, tomorrow at the tour, uh, we'll be the first group that will show you some of this large 15-acre uh, block that was broken into plots, looking at conventional versus organic versus uh, the 10% uh, field rate. So with that,